Hi everybody, welcome to New Hope United Methodist Church, and I'm so glad that you chose uh, to worship with us today on this first Sunday of Advent. Um, if um, it's suddenly occurred to me that um, I have no idea who is joining us online, um, it could be that someone is joining us for the first time um, and uh, it does not come from a Christian tradition or comes from a Christian tradition that doesn't celebrate Advent. Um, and you might be wondering, what is this Advent thing? Well, we'll get to that here in just a second. Um, for you lifelong United Methodists or Catholics or Episcopals uh, who have joined, joined us today, um, you know what we're talking about. Um, and I'm glad that you are all here. Uh, whether you come from a Christian tradition or not, I'm glad, I'm glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. We're going to start out today with an Advent candle lighting. Um, and throughout this Advent season, we will be lighting a candle each week. Um, and it's gonna be lit by people who are part of our congregation. Um, so uh, today will be my wife, Krista. If ever there was a year that we needed Advent, this is that year. We hardly know how to describe the year that we've lived through and we hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known so that nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. So we light this first candle as a sign of hope. Hope that you can meet us even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us. Though we feel we are lost in the rubble, let this light be the light that guides us and brings us to Emmanuel once more. O oh, holy God, we worship you, the source of our hope. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. A shoot shall come out from the stalk of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide by what, by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. 
But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our two readings for today present a, a juxtaposition of sorts. In the first, the prophet Isaiah relays God's promise that the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the lion and the fatling and the calf together, and a little child shall lead them. A little child, the one who we celebrate on the 25th of this coming month. In the second, Mark records for a later generation Jesus' promise to return and exhorts them to keep awake, to keep watch. Christmas and the second coming. Every year, Advent begins with Armageddon, the first and final coming just smashed together, a little baby in a manger, the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power. And both are marked by signs in the heavens and times of turmoil. Let me read again from the Gospel of Mark. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Unlike the Christmas pageants of my childhood, passages like this one instilled little Nathan with horrible fear. God will come, the preachers would say, and throw his enemies into the fire. Great and terrible, the judgment. Madeline Langwell captures the tone of this passage in a poem that she wrote for the season of Advent, which is a time in which we Christians prepare ourselves for the coming of the Christ child. She writes, when will he come, and how will he come, and will there be warnings, and will there be thunders and rumbles of armies coming before him, and banners and trumpets? When will he come, and how will he come, and will we be ready? Oh, woe to you, people! You sleep through the thunder. You heed not the warnings and the fires and the drownings. 
the earthquakes and stormings, and ignorant armies, and dark closing on you. The songbirds are falling, the seabirds are dying, no fish now are leaping. The children are choking in air, not for breathing. The aged are gasping with no one to tend them. A bright star has blazed forth and no one has seen it. And no one has wakened. Reading that poem in the passage above, I find myself asking, have we kept awake? There's a particular part of that that stands out to me this year and years, um, in ways that it hasn't in years past. Talking about the aged are gasping with no one to tend them. A time when the coronavirus is lit quite literally choking out our elderly and causing a shortage of those who are tasked with their care, causing it to be that, that family and loved ones can't be around. In, in this situation, I ask the question, where is the light of Advent hope? In our scriptures, the scholars universally say that, that the fear and the violence that, that we find um, in passages like we heard from the Gospel of Mark, that that fear and violence is descriptive, not proscriptive. That they are descriptions of the way the world is, not how it must be or will be or should be. Um, it's easy, I think, for us to compare and contrast the, the first coming of Christ with the last. Um, but I think that ultimately that's not a helpful thing for us to do on this first season, or this first Sunday of Advent. Even during the first coming, the expected Messiah was the victorious king, the one who would come and finally overthrow Israel's oppressors through military might. But the Messiah that came instead came as a child who gave his own life to spread the love of God to everyone. And so I find it ironic that many suggest that the returning Christ will come as a military king to vanquish his foes. Um, and I think that that is to make the same mistake as our ancestors in the faith did. To say that the first coming of Christ, the way that Christ came the first time, as the Prince of Peace, as the child who would give his life, that somehow that must have been a mistake. But the Christ that will come, the Christ that will come again, is the same Christ who died to show the world what self-giving love looks like, and we know that because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thanks be to God. And that is indeed good news. And that is why we light the, hand, the candle of hope on this, the first Sunday of Advent. So the, the four weeks leading up to Christmas... Uh, are a season in the church that we call Advent. Um, and this, this word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming toward. Um, and the season denotes a time of preparation for the coming of Christ. And that is why for, for this week and for next week, you're not going to hear any music at our church proclaiming that the Lord is born. Um, that is for Christmas, and we will celebrate Christmas for 12 days, and then we'll celebrate Epiphany, and we keep that celebration going for a while, so there's plenty of time to celebrate the Lord being born. But in these weeks, we do something different. The season of Advent 
is not merely about the warm fuzzies that many of us get on Christmas morning. It is mired in uncertainty, uneasiness, restlessness. The call of Advent isn't a call to rush headlong into Christmas. God knows there's enough rushing this time of year already. The call of Advent is the call to slow down, find stillness and centeredness. The call of Advent is the call to prepare. The church tradition of featuring an apocalyptic reading on the first Sunday of Advent raises an important question. Just what are we preparing for? Is it the birth of Christ or the second coming? Well, the answer is yes. Advent is in tension between past and future, between what has been, what is, and, and what will be. This timey-wimey stuff, it isn't particularly logical. The very essence of time breaks down as we seek to enter this season and take hope in the coming of Christ. Already, but not yet, this is Emmanuel, God with us, the once and future king. This is the world in which new life is entered and in which we await new life. This is the day of doubt and hope, of a world that is dying and, and yet redeemed, of a world that is redeemed and yet dying. The call of Advent brings us face to face with our need for Christ in our lives and in the world. It urges us to, to dig deep into the anguish and pain of alienation, isolation, because these stories are the stories of Advent, of unexpected and dubious pregnancy, of homelessness and denial, of refugees and genocide. These stories call us to look for Christ in the dark places, to look for him in the present suffering, to look for him, but also to find him, to find him in darkness, to find him in suffering, to find him in hope, Find him in every unwed teen mother. Find him in every person experiencing homelessness. Find him at every, in every refugee at the border. And to find him within. If the stories of this season don't call us to see the world differently, then it can truly be said that a bright star has blazed forth and no one has seen it. But Advent awakens us to the absence, to the presence, and to the coming of Christ by helping us see through time. To see hopelessness, hope blazing bright, and hope on the horizon. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus speaks about taking a lesson from the fig tree. And he says that when you see the buds on the tree start to blossom, then, then you know that summer is near. And he connects this with, with stories of seeing pain and great fear. And I take this to mean that when we see fear, when we see suffering, when we see anguish, when it looks like the end is near, it's really just the beginning. It's really just the beginning because summer is near. New life and longer days are coming. 
And that is hope. Hope that is coming. A hope that is in us. A hope that calls us more than ever to wait. Now, throughout most of the year, I talk a big game about all of the things that we need to do. All of the actions that we need to take as Christians to be the hope for the world. But in the first couple of weeks of Advent, I think it's important for us to also learn how to wait. And I think that's actually more clear this year than in, <laughs> in any other year uh, that we have experienced Advent. Because all of the scientists, all of our health professionals are telling us that the best thing that we can do to love and care for one another is to literally do nothing, is just to sit at home and to do nothing. And I think as action forward people, uh, that can make us deeply uncomfortable. But Advent is a season of, yes, preparation, but also a season of waiting. And waiting always involves stillness. And so if you will indulge me one more poem, I'd like to close with this poem by T.S. Eliot. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. And wait without love, for love would be love for the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. And wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light, and the stillness the dancing. In this season, of darkness, the season of fear, know that summer and hope are coming. All glory be to God. Keep awake. Amen.